parts to innovation. There's invention and there's commercialization. And we literally at MIT say invention, innovation equals invention plus commercialization. We like equations. An idea, a technology, uh, a patent, a new process is not innova innovation, it's an invention. Until it's commercialized and goes in the market and creates value for someone, then it becomes innovation. There's different types of innovation. You know, even though we're from MIT, um, there's, there's disruptive and there's incremental innovation. But within disruptive innovation, there's technology, there's business model, there's process, and there's other types of innovation that people can have. And the people focus on disruptive technological innovation, and especially when you're thinking about energy. That's to me the hardest, while it's the most sexy, it can be the hardest, riskiest type. And frequently, business model innovation is much more productive and lower risk. Much more productive, I should say, generates much more value to it in the marketplace. Take Salesforce.com, Blockbuster Video, it's just a kind of business model innovation. Innovation in energy has been uh, almost an oxymoron uh, in some regards. It takes 20, 30, 40, 40 plus years sometimes for invention to become innovation, even when it's clear that it works, be it horizontal drilling, seismic data analysis, or, or other things. Um, but we can't allow that to happen anymore, and people are not going to. There's been a lack of um, resources, of, uh, frankly, money applied to it, and the conservative gatekeepers of it, the, the large companies, have kind of resisted that. That's all got to change now, the challenges we face with energy, be it economic, environmental, and national security. So there's a huge push in it, but it's not easy. Uh, people have to look more, and I just talked about the different types. Incremental innovation actually is much easier. And when you're talking about the scale that you have in energy, incremental innovations can be huge. So let's take, for instance, if I say I'm only going to increase the um, enhanced oil recovery, I'm going to increase the rate of recovery by 0.01%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that can create billions of dollars. If you talk about a refining process, or I'm going to clean, I'm going to make coal cleaner by some incremental percent. That's huge. The, the economic, the environmental, and the national security ramifications are huge. So, an energy incremental, incremental is important. But a lot of times, technology is not the issue in, in energy. It might be a policy. It might be a process. It might be how you work, the workflow. So, innovation in those areas is even more important. Just. But earlier this week we were talking about it and the question was we had with the panel was is technology overrated when it comes to energy and the panel we all basically agreed that yes it probably was <laughs>
But that was not a technological innovation. Again, that was a business model innovation. But that's the exception. The rule is much, much longer. And in fact, if you go about it now, a lot of the energy innovation is going to come from companies that have already existed, not from new companies that just started from the ground and they're building new plants. Or, or, but there's a lot of good companies now that we need to look at and take them to the next level, scale them. This economic slump, I, I would tell you, while it has some downside, that it's hard to get capital to finance uh, projects for, for, for clean energy, um, it has a very good effect otherwise, because it separates the players from the pretenders. It, it's a good shock to the system, so people realize this isn't going to be easy in energy. There's no quick and easy way to, to solve the energy challenge we have. And you need to have very strong fundamentals, um, manage your cash and don't have dependencies on the price of oil being $150 a barrel or dependent on subsidies from the government. There are a lot of good businesses that don't need that and those are the ones that we should really be focused on. And by the way, when you separate that out, the companies that are good will get really good people. They're going to get, and, this is, and if you look at history, a lot of the great companies were started in economic downturns. There's two things right now that I think are the, uh, kind of moving in. One of them is now people got this, I mentioned six months ago, is water. I think that people looked at energy and said, we have an energy pro a challenge, which we do. Um, but then they started trading water for energy, and that's not a good trade-off. So when you look at energy and you flip the coin over, you actually find that the other side is water. And so water is actually a more important thing when you think of Maslow's hierarchy. It's a, it's a more important thing for, for life than, than energy is. So that trade-off is not a good one. So there's, water has all the same characteristics of energy. Capital intensive, conservative gatekeepers, um, political ramifications to it because you're providing a, a service to, to all levels of society. Um, but I think that it's a problem that needs to be solved. And it's a huge, huge challenge to, to us going forward. I think that's one. The other one I think is I am very excited about electric vehicles. And I don't think people really understand yet the impact that electric vehicles can have. Because basically today we have two energy infrastructures. We have one that's the oil infrastructure um, that's for energy, and the other one's the electricity infrastructure. And the issue with the oil is uh, you have the com it's driven by the combustion engine, basically the car using gasoline. But the efficiency of the combustion engine is quite low. Um, so that's a problem, so you're not getting, and the second thing is, in national security, it comes from places that aren't necessarily friendly to us, so there's a dependency on it. Um, whether they're friendly to us today or tomorrow, there's a dependency on it. On the flip side, if you have the electrical one, the issue with that, while you don't have those issues, is that you have an outdated grid and you have very low capacity asset utilization, uh, capacity utilization, because it goes up and down. What you really need is a storage solution. Now, all of a sudden, along come electric vehicles, plug-in vehicles, and you can take them, and now they become the batteries for your electrical system, if you use that, that allow you to manage these peak loads, these ups and downs, because they're going to buffer the system. Well, that makes this electrical system infrastructure very, very interesting now, because you can get better capacity utilization. And oh, by the way, the demand's going to be going up and used more efficiently, because now the automobiles are going on to this. So now all of a sudden, if I'm the U.S. government, I look at this, I say, I want this infrastructure to win, so why wouldn't I be doing it? So now the U.S. government and other people should start to invest in the smart grid and all these other things that are, that are weak in the system today. So I see it kind of like when I was in computers in the 1980s, you had two, you had three operating systems actually. You had the DOS operating system, which IBM endorsed, you had the CPM operating system, then you had the Macintosh. But when it became clear that the IBM was going to be all the investments, all the software developers, or the predominance that wrote for this, and that became the, the Microsoft monopoly basically. So I see, the, I see this as a potential tipping point where all of a sudden people, the, the real innovators, will start to move over to the electrical infrastructure, which the U.S. government will certainly want to encourage.